it's Amriane Towers. I am from the Research Institute of the McGill University Health Centre and the McGill University in Montreal, Canada. Interestingly, the prevalence of hypertension continues to grow. Even though we've known for many, many years that it is the number one killer in the world, the prevalence continues to grow. And unfortunately, one of the unmet needs is that as a healthcare system, we are not doing a good enough job in actually managing hypertension and high blood pressure. So I think that is one of the major needs today in terms of better treating, managing patients with hypertension. So on behalf of the um, task force of the ESC 2024 guidelines and my co-chair, um, we came up with 57 new recommendations in the uh, 2024 guidelines. This was in addition to over 100 revisions of the previous guidelines published in 2018. I think one of the paradigm shifting new recommendations is that we have made the classification of blood pressure categories more practical and these categories really have important clinical implications. So what are these categories? Well, in the past um, guidelines of 2018, we had seven categories defining hypertension. We now have three. The first one is non-elevated blood pressure, and that is a blood pressure of 120 over 70 millimeters of mercury. The second category is what we call elevated blood pressure, and that would be a blood pressure of 120 to 139 or 70 to 89 diastolic. And then we have the definition of hypertension as being the classical definition of 140 over 90. And the implications of these categories are very important for the management of hypertension. Just building a little bit on those new classifications, as I've said, we have come up with new treatment plans or algorithms for the management of hypertension. And the focus really is on the non is, excuse me, is on the elevated blood pressure category. We feel that by preventing an increase in blood pressure, there's tremendous evidence that one can prevent the cardiovascular risks such as heart disease, stroke, vascular dementia, and chronic kidney disease. And what we recommend in these new guidelines is that blood pressure in patients who are in the elevated blood pressure category need to be treated firstly with lifestyle modifications and if blood pressure is still not at target which we consider 120 to 129 or 70 to 79 pharmacological therapy should be started if blood pressure is 130 to 139 in this group of non-elevated blood pressure. I also want to highlight that we have included some new recommendations on lifestyle for example increasing potassium intake, either through a potassium-rich diet or potassium um, supplemented salts rather than sodium containing salts. But this needs to be in patients who've got normal kidney function. Also, we recommend avoidance of sugary drinks, uh, sugar containing foods, and also, of course, emphasizing exercise, a healthy diet, um, reduced alcohol intake, etc. And finally, I want to say that in our guidelines, we have emphasized that even older patients, up to 85 years, who are functional, who are not frail, should be treated the same way as one would treat a younger person. That being said, if an older person does exhibit symptoms of orthostatic hypotension or other symptoms associated with too low a blood pressure, then the recommendations are to treat as low as reasonably achievable, the ALARA principle. So we recognize that while there are many guidelines available, unfortunately these guidelines are not always implemented and this is probably one of the um, barriers, one of the challenges we have. We hope that these guidelines will be used more frequently because we have made them to be more user-friendly as I've said, the fact that we have categorized blood pressure into three very practical um, classifications based on 
evidence such that these classifications are associated with different degrees of risk um, should make it more easy and user-friendly for the healthcare providers to actually be using these guidelines. I should also say something else that we have introduced in these guidelines for the first time is we have highlighted the challenges of implementation, highlighting that the healthcare providers really need to rise to the cause and to the challenge of using guidelines so that they can be effective in ensuring optimal care for patients.